not for the not for the first part of the title, but for the second part of the title and the Vismut. So I would start with the Vismut and then move on from there to first principles associated with characteristics of arbitration, in particular party autonomy and its limits, fair and efficient proceedings and replacement of the court. Um, and then as a final principle, the principle of good faith, which may be relevant in this moot court case. Um, you probably are aware that uh, at this stage, uh, when you're still struggling to get a hold of everything, I will not go into greater detail concerning the actual case. But before I start looking into some of the principles which may be relevant for the case, let me first congratulate you uh, and congratulate you for several things. First of all, for having made the choice to participate. I assume that whatever comes out of that event, it will be either even life-changing event or at least have in the end provided you with so much new knowledge and often also new friends, um, more than you have acquired during the other universities. Also congratulations for having being selected to represent your university. Some of you will say, but what do you mean selected? We were the only few who applied to participate. Nevertheless, you represent your university. And I can tell you that there are numerous universities where there is a serious selection process. I know from some of the German universities, which started with a seminar on the CSG, which has approximately 30 people, and then select 10 people who are representing the university at the Bismuth. And the other 20 are then either joining a supporting staff or are at least somehow related to the team. So that also shows something that there may be a not completely balanced, uh, not completely level playing field. If you compete with a team which has these type of selection process, which has these type of human resources, and then also a great alumni network, they have much more resources than many of your teams have. And last but not least, congratulations for having stayed on until now. Um, I know that for a lot of you who have never been in contact with arbitration, have never been in contact with the CSG, the uh, original case may, may have come as a major surprise and you will have struggled understanding, dealing with the issues. And that is also something which you will see at the end uh, of the written phase, your understanding of the CSG of arbitration is completely different from the one you have now. At present, you're dealing with individual small points without seeing the major or the larger system. At the end of the, at least at the end of the mood itself, the majority of you will have an understanding of arbitration, will have an understanding of the CSG, which is better than approximately 95% of the colleagues I know. Because making a proper argument in the mood will require you to have a broader view, uh, not only on the two questions relating to arbitration or the two questions relating to the CSG, but on the underlying principles, because that distinguishes the excellent teams from the very good teams, that the excellent teams have the grip of the system, have the understanding, and then can argue in a much more convincing way using the entire system. So what is the mood all about? The mood all of is for us primary an educational event. And then it's organized as a competition. When you look at that, that is our understanding. Your understanding at present probably is it's a competition. And I've been a mood coach for quite some time. I've coached the Cologne team for seven years. And I know that as a coach, as someone close to the students, you see the competition element much more than the educational element very often. Looking backwards and now being in a different role, uh, you will probably value the educational event much more in the end. And also when we draft the case, we have primarily the educational event in mind. 
when I look at the case, when I prepare the case, it's usually over the year I select interesting information, bits and pieces here and there. I take certain problems from my case and then try to put that into a dispute which has two legal problems on procedure, two legal problems on, on uh, substance, but which has much more or which is much broader than just the two topics. So this year you could learn about uh, the requirements for consent uh, under path, under the rules of uh, Equatoriana and what happens if their government of uh, consent is not given in a proper way. But that would be too narrow if you approach it like that one. What we want to do is we want to, as I said, give you a broader understanding. So there are a number of issues which may not be directly on the point, but which will be crucial for you to understand um, to properly argue the case. And second, we also try always to have what we call a kind of topical issue. And this year, the topical issue is corruption. I think uh, a lot of you will know from on experiences or from your country or from the newspapers that corruption is one of the major obstacles to all types of developments. And we try to find something where you have an issue which may be controversial or otherwise interesting. And when you look at the cor corruption issue, and that is also something you will find here in the case, there may be indications for corruptions, but also Often the corruption allegation is used by state parties, whatever, to get out of a contract, which may have been very favorable looked at by a previous government, but now things have changed. And then the new government wants to get out. And very often the allegation of corruption is one of the first allegation which is raised. And um, you will be surprised how rarely the allegation of corruption is successful in arbitration, which doesn't mean that there is no corruption, but at least there is a problem with proving corruption because one of the issues, and you probably read into that already, is that corruption is normally not done in the open. So proving that as a party may be difficult. And so you have certain what we call red flags which have been set up by institutions of like Transparency International and which indicate here we have a higher level of corruption or there's a higher risk that there's corruption involved. And not every of these red flags is really an indication of corruption in a particular case. So we are in a real case, it will very much turn about proving that burden of proof, whatever, here in the Wismut case, we have uh, questions of more legal question than questions of proving facts. Last year, for example, we had the issue of palm oil, yeah, where you could look at it from an environmental side and uh, be very much against palm oil, but you could also look at it from a development side and say it's a crucial element in developing certain areas, and it's a crucial element for the economy of certain countries. So in devising the case, we try to find something where you can have different views uh, and where it's important also to look at the other side. And that is one of the good things at the mood. You have to present both sides, which is one of the training things which makes the mood so valuable for your later career as arbitrator or in primary as counsel that you know it's rarely black and white, but they're always good arguments for both sides. Second, we want to have the mood case and the experience for you as close to reality as possible. So what does that mean? We try to take on cases uh, which have either occurred like that in practice or we, where we have or where I have taken some of my own cases and turned them into a mood problem, combining certain issues 
uh, from areas I've taken. And also this year, when you look at the problem, both CSG problems come from real cases. Um, you will not find the award, yeah, and because the question of whether the drone is uh, aircraft in the sense of Article 2 of the CSG was a crucial element in one of my cases. And when the parties approached me uh, whether I would be available as an arbitrator, uh, I was when I when I heard that they are looking into drones, I was really happy and already at that time decided that I would turn it into a Vismut case. Unfortunately, uh, in the real case, we never got to the discussion because it was not really relevant in that case. Yeah, whether we had the CSG applicable or the other potential law applicable, it didn't really matter. So we could leave the question open. But uh, there had been some preliminary arguments on that, and uh, some of the facts you will find here come out of these preliminary arguments. On the other hand, a real case goes on for normally much longer, or often much longer than you have, in particular the oral hearing is much longer. So we have to adapt that a little bit. But as I said, the underlying problems are coming from cases I have had in practice. That leads me to the competition element. Uh, the element you're looking at primarily, and here it, that is usually the most difficult part. You have a problem in mind, but then you have to try to balance it. And it's not always possible to balance every single issue evenly between claimant and respondent. But at least overall, there should be a balanced approach for claimant and respondent. And even if it isn't, very often the party who has an uphill battle uh, in the end gets better grades because it's much more difficult. And those arbitrators who are familiar with the case will know that a party has an uphill battle. Um, when you look at the competition element, as I said, they're very often in these cases arguments, if you run one argument on the procedural side, uh, which gives you a strong argument on the procedural side, you will have a weakened your argument on the substantive side. So there's also an element of strategy involved that the two, uh, two counsel in the case, in the end, decide what strategy to follow, whether they have a go a little bit weaker on the procedural side, to have big, bigger chances on the substantive side or vice versa. So again, that is something which plays a role also in practice very often that you have to define your case strategy. You have to define your narrative of the case uh, and thereby perhaps exclude some of the arguments you would like to make. And last but not least, for us, the mood is a social, uh, has a social and a networking element. And we were struggling with a number of requests uh, coming this year from universities, in particular from Africa, but also other areas of the world where it may be difficult to find sufficient funding to come to Vienna. After three years of having virtual moods, we had last year for the first time a kind of hybrid mood where we had teams coming to Vienna and uh, participating in what we call a social bubble in Vienna, while the mooting as such was uh, done on an, via the internet. And we have seen that the social and networking element is so important that for us, we took the decision to go back to real uh, in-person mood in Vienna, even if that means we might lose out on some of the teams. What we will try to do is to find out or to find funding to get as many of you to Vienna as possible, supporting that and connecting teams with sponsors. But my experience is that if you plan that in the majority of countries, there will be at least someone who has made a career somewhere abroad or has made a career in the country who, once they get involved into the mood, is willing to fund that. So that was a little bit about the background of the case. The objective we pursue 
with the VIS and why we are also so keen that we have more teams from Africa. And we're extremely grateful to the organization Africa and the Mood that they have organized that in a slightly structured way to bring coaches and potential teams together and also trying to help bringing teams to Vienna by allocating funds to teams or at least organizing events within Africa, which give you at least the one social and networking event in, in Africa uh, without the need to travel to, to Europe. So much for the end the mood part of the, of the title. Let me now come to the basic principles because these basic principles naturally play an important role for all these objectives I have just mentioned. Because the educational event, understanding beyond the specific legal problems, has to do with the general principles. And the importance of the general principles are already underlined by the fact if you compare your arbitration law, if you compare the answer to a model law with normally your code of civil procedure in the jurisdictions which have a code of civil procedure, and look at the extent or the number of articles, you will see that the arbitration law is very short. The answer trial model law has less than 40 articles, which means within these few articles, you have to basically regulate everything and for the rest have to rely on the basic principles. And as I said, a lot of the basic principles or the main principle of arbitration, which is relevant for that, follows from the characteristic of arbitration. And we have defined arbitration in a book I wrote jointly with Julie Liu and Lucas Mistelius in 2003. We have defined arbitration as a process in which the parties agree to refer the dispute to one or more neutral person, arbitrators, in lieu of the court system for judicial determination with a binding effect. If there will ever be a second edition of that book, I would probably now add and constituting enforceable title because the binding effect is not uh, is characteristic to arbitration, but is not unique to arbitration. In the meantime, you have a number of other forms of dispute resolution where you have a decision by a third party, uh, an adjudicator, an expert, whatever, which renders a decision with a binding effect but that decision does not constitute an enforceable title, but merely constitutes a kind of contract. So from that definition, when you look at that, you can derive a number of characteristics of arbitration. And the first one is, and you see that highlighted in red, party autonomy. And party autonomy governs first the referral of disputes because you need an arbitration agreement and you also need a decision by the party, usually the claimant, to bring a particular dispute to arbitration. And it frequently happens that there is a major dispute, but only a small part of that is brought to arbitration. And then it's for you as a tribunal just to decide that minor part. You know there's a bigger dispute out there. You know that they're not presenting everything. But if the parties do not want to present the entire dispute, you cannot do anything as a tribunal. But party autonomy also governs the structure of the proceedings. And that is one of the reasons why you have so few rules on procedure, because it's all about party autonomy. And where the parties have not exercised their autonomy, usually they have given the power to the arbitral tribunal to adapt the procedure uh, to the actual dispute. And that is one of the strengths of arbitration. And sometimes I ask myself, why are the parties not making use of that much more? Why do we have the standard procedure order number one, which very often, in my view, would not fit a particular case? I'm always annoyed when I'm sitting in an arbitration, if there's a smaller case and someone comes with the procedure order number one, setting out procedure rules of 25 pages. That is not suitable for the particular case. And that is something, and I will show you that later, parties which are aware of the character of that particular characteristic sometimes come up with rules where you would say wow yeah i would have never thought of that and that also affects somehow our mood court so sometimes we have 
to squeeze the case into a moot court setting, we have to come up with very odd agreements by the parties. But as a professor and a practitioner, I know that as a professor, you cannot think so outside the box that you will not find that particular provision somewhere in practice. So party autonomy concerns also the structure of the proceedings and also the applicable law. That means the merits. The second element you may derive from that definition I've given you, it's a judicial determination. And here again, from that judicial determination, there follow a number of characteristics which have underlying principles which are relevant for any arbitration procedure and to some extent also limit party autonomy. And that's first judicial determination means there must be the right to be heard must be guaranteed. And there must be equal treatment between the parties and the decision maker must be neutral. Because judicial determination means in the end there's a decision by someone, by a third party, which is binding upon you, upon which the bailiff will enforce uh, the award against your property. So that is justified if there's really a neutral person, that is justified if both parties are treated equal, and that is justified if your right to be heard has been properly protected. And it's very often the question of right to be heard properly protected, which comes up in post-award proceedings when someone tries either to resist enforcement or to challenge an award. Because proper protection of the right to be heard sometimes requires that you give more time to a party because it's much more difficult as a claimant to present your case than as a respondent to destroy your case. So what you have here is very often a balancing exercise between competing requirements. On the one hand, the right to be heard. On the other hand, the equal treatment. And that is also something which may play a role in the mood that you have a certain principle and you have to balance it against other principles. And that makes it also easier in a competition that you emphasize one point, the other side emphasize the other point. But understanding that is the important part. And the last element is in lieu of the state court. What does that mean? In lieu of the state court, on the one hand, the state courts have to deny jurisdiction or stay the proceedings if despite an arbitration agreement, an action is brought in front of them. But it also requires that there should be an enforceable result. So arbitration will only succeed if in the end you have a decision which is equivalent to something you get from the state courts. So when you put that graphically, what party autonomy means in arbitration, you have in principle someone normally ending up with its dispute in the state court system. And that person by using its party autonomy, by agreeing to arbitration, opts out of the state court system and opts into the arbitration system. And the state courts at this stage have to deny jurisdiction. And as I said, you will find that in the backbone of international arbitration, the New York Convention. And we'll look at that in a moment because I would like to discuss also the limits to party autonomy with you. So here you move out of the system, but it requires a valid arbitration agreement. Then you have everything in the arbitration system, uh, the initiation of the proceedings, the tribunal, the arbitral procedure, decision on merits and the final award just in the end for the enforcement to move into back into the court system because arbitrators lack any enforcement powers. So again, you're at the gateways in into the arbitration system and from the arbitration system, there is some time of control. And when you look at that, the control are very often the limits imposed by the national laws over certain requirements. And the most important limit you have here which may also play a role in our case, and the limit which is also controlled here is arbitrability. So when you look at arbitrability, when you look at, sorry, Article, Article 2 of the New York Convention, 
you will clearly say that Article 2 of the New York Convention, which is the first major obligation under the New York Convention, requires contracting states to recognize an agreement in writing. And what does it mean, recognize an agreement in writing? They have, their courts have to refer the parties to arbitration if one of the parties invokes that. However, there are certain limits to that. And they have only have to recognize that if the subject matter is capable of settlement by arbitration. And they only have to refer the parties to arbitration if the said agreement is not null and void, inoperative or incapable of being performed. So the question is, what, when is a subject matter capable of settlement by arbitration? Let's have a closer look at the concept of arbitrability. And when you look at the concept of arbitrability, as which had been summarized by Gary Bowen in the following way, the non-arbitrability doctrine rests on the notion that some matters so pervasively involve either public rights and concerns or the interests of third parties, which are the subject of unique government authority that agreements to resolve such dispute by private arbitration should not be given effect. So you have two underlying principles which may limit arbitration. And that is just the basic concept. And the basic concept may differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. You will have no definition of arbitrability in the New York Convention. You have no definition of what disputes are arbitrable in the model law. But that is left to every national legislator to define that. And when you look at the national legislation, which is relevant because there is no direct regulation in the international rules, you first have to ask yourself which national legislation is relevant. For courts, it's always easy. Every court will look into its own rules on arbitrability. For an arbitral tribunal, it may be much more difficult because the arbitral tribunal is perceived in numerous jurisdictions as being an organization of international commerce and not being part of the judicial system of a particular jurisdiction. So the question is, at the early stage, when one of the parties challenges the jurisdiction, as it happens in the moot court case here, where should the arbitral tribunal look for the question of arbitrability? At the post-award stage, at the enforcement stage, there may be certain conflict of law rules. At the early stage, at the jurisdiction stage, not. So there are no international rules. And when you look to the national rules, you have different concepts. In a number of, number of jurisdictions, you have no special regulation on arbitrability. They just will rely on general principles. And typical example of that are the United Kingdom or the United States. You will have a number of Supreme Court decisions by the American Supreme Court which clearly show you how they try to balance the competing interests. On the one hand, party autonomy. On the other hand, the interests of the states in not allowing certain disputes going to arbitration for whatever reason, because they're either so important for the economy or because they involve third parties uh, which may not have consented to arbitration. And then there's a second set of jurisdictions where you have a special rule dealing with arbitrability and you only rely on the general principles for the exceptions from that general rules. Typical examples are France and Switzerland. And when you look at this second set of jurisdictions, what are the principles underlying arbitrability? There is on the one hand, uh, the right to dispose of matters or matters should be capable of settlement by uh, by the parties, because the idea is if you can dispose of matters, if you can solve your dispute by a settlement, you should also be able to refer that to arbitration. And then there's a broader concept which says whenever there's a pecuniary interest involved, there's an economic interest involved, that dispute should be able to be referred to arbitration. And when we look at some of the national provisions following that approach, you have on the one hand, for example, the Italian Code of Civil Procedure, following this slightly narrower approach where they said the parties may have disputes which have arisen between them decided by arbitrators, 
provided the subject matter does not concern rights which may not be disposed. So the settlement element plays a role there. And the settlement element also plays a role under French law. Uh, one can arbitrate with respect to all rights of which one can dispose freely. And when you look where you find that provision, that is not in the Code of Civil Procedure, but it's in the Civil Code. But then there is an important provision in the Civil Code that certain disputes may not be submitted to arbitration. And these are the disputes which concern public establishment and more generally matters that concern the public order. I think by now everyone is probably familiar with the French concept of contrat administratif, where we have an issue there. And that comes back from that provision. It embodies a little bit the French idea of that there may be certain disputes where the public is involved, where public entities involved, which may not be referred to arbitration. However, the French then goes on, public establishment of industrial commercial character can by decree be authorized to arbitrate. You will see that there is no authorization or no decree given in the facts of the mood. So it may not be the French provision which is relevant here. We're dealing with Equatoriana, but some of the ideas coming from the French law are embodied here. And then you have the German law, which has a slightly broader approach where they say any claim involving economic interest can be subject to an arbitration agreement. And only if there's no economic interest involved, then the parties must be entitled or um, can only refer those disputes to arbitration where they can also conclude a settlement. And the underlying rationale is arbitration as a certain process allows you to go further to settle or to give you, give you more party autonomy than if they're just the two parties involved. You can compare arbitration under that concept a little bit with a public notary. Certain rights you may not be able to dispose of without the involvement of a public notary. And the arbitrator then may be taking the function as a neutral third party of a public notary, uh, allowing the parties to enlarge their party autonomy. And now let's look at the last provision of Singaporean law, where you have a rule which says um, everything can be submitted to arbitration unless it's contrary to public policy to do so. And again, it's a very broad rule which has to be put into practice in an every individual case. But it refers a little bit back to Gary Bourne's general description of public uh, of arbitrability, where it says everything may be referred to arbitration unless the state considers it to be part of public policy. And what is also important here, the Singaporean law describes that the mere conferral of exclusive jurisdiction to a particular state court does not necessarily exclude the arbitrability of a particular dispute. And that shows that in a number of jurisdictions, really arbitration is considered to be exactly equal to state court proceedings, that if you refer certain disputes to particular state courts, it only concerns the state court system, but not arbitration. It does not prevent you from contracting out of that. So summarizing that, when you look at that, the criteria for arbitrability, you have either claims capable of settlement by arbitration, you have claims involving economic interest, or you may have broader references to public policy, or just take the American approach of a balancing of interest involved there, party autonomy on the one hand, pacta sunt servanda, and the interest of the state to protect certain things on the other hand. And the rules providing exclusive jurisdiction to a particular court may play a role. So, as I said, you have RB, you have party autonomy at the stage what disputes can be referred to arbitration. And as I said, that is one of the problems which may also play a role in the Bismuth case. Um, but party autonomy has a broader implication. It also affects all the arbitration proceedings. Uh, the parties are entirely free to agree on the composition of the arbitral tribunal. When I say entirely free, it's not completely right, because I'll come to that in a moment. There are limits imposed by other things. 
You can determine the procedure largely free. Again, there are certain limits by other requirements. You determine which claims and evidence you want to submit to the arbitral tribunal, and the tribunal may not go beyond that. Again, a problem which may sometimes rise in these corruption cases that during the arbitration, one of the parties is not submitting all evidence for the corruption case because they do not want to disclose that they had been involved in bribery. Once the dispute has been lost in the enforcement, at the enforcement stage, they come up with an entire new evidentiary record and now trying to show that there has been corruption involved. And also the law applicable to the merits may be chosen by the parties. However, as I said, there's again a balancing process. The guarantee of a fair trial, which I mentioned at the beginning, which is a hallmark of judicial determination of disputes, impose certain limits on that. So there are limits on the free selection of the arbitral tribunal. They must be independent. There are limits on the determination of the procedure. There must be an equal treatment of the parties and the right to be heard must be protected. And these are also obligations for the arbitral tribunal. And when again, you look at that uh, in a graphical way, here we are not dealing with the gateway to arbitration, but we are dealing with limits imposed by due process requirement to the actual arbitral procedure. And the moot court only deals with this part, the arbitration proceedings. However, often the arguments also come from you should do the following because otherwise the award would not be enforceable, or you should do the following because otherwise, or the dispute may not be referred to arbitration. And what may also play a role at the merit stage, are there certain mandatory rules? And again, these mandatory rules may come from different, have different backgrounds. And the mandatory rules may also come not only from the CSG, which contains just default rules, but may co come from other, from national law. And you have here, one of the problems is, are the national rules on misrepresentation, can they be applied in addition to the CSG? So again, it's an underlying problem there, which may not be a clear problem here of mandatory rules, but which comes close to the same, or uh, involves to some extent the same um, issues. As I said, arbitrability, validity of the arbitration agreement play a role at the gateway stages, but may also play a role in discussing everything at the arbitral tribunal. There's a third principle that of limited judicial intervention involved in the Ansutran model. And the Ansutran model law is based on the idea that courts should normally not interfere with an arbitration procedure during the arbitration procedure, only at the post award stage should there be any control. And when courts interfere in arbitration, it's primary to support arbitration or to supervise the or to guarantee the fairness of the proceedings. And that principle is closely connected with the final principle concerning the arbitral procedure, and that is a guarantee of an effective procedure. So a modern arbitration law now contains a number of provision which ensures that even if one of the parties is not participating, there will be an award at the end of the proceedings. So you guarantee the constitution of the tribunal by being allowed to go to the state courts or to go to an arbitral institution to get the tribunal constituted. You can have a hearing without an obstructing party. So it's not violating a party's right to be heard uh, if only one party is available at the hearing. You have a guarantee of efficient interim relief that the state courts help you if you cannot set up the tribunal in time to get interim relief. And you have also support in taking of evidence. If the tribunal lacks the necessary powers to get third parties involved, to get witnesses involved, which have not submitted to arbitration, you may go to the state courts. And last but not least, there are certain rules discussing the uh, decisions by the arbitral tribunal, they may take by majority, may be taken by majority, and if one of the arbitrators refuses to sign the award after there had been a deliberation, uh, 
he or she cannot prevent the rendering of an award. And the last principle, which I would like to discuss, general principle coming from the correctness of arbitration, you will find it embodied in Article 3 of the New York Convention. And Article 3 of the New York Convention, which is the second major obligation resulting from the New York Convention, is that the contracting states have to recognize arbitral awards and enforce them in accordance with the rule of the procedure of their own rules of procedure, but the general obligation to recognize and enforce arbitral awards exist. However, you will find certain limits in Article 5, and in the moot court discussions, very often these limits in Article 5 play a role because as an arbitrator, the last thing you want is render an award, which is later not enforceable. So as an arbitrator, normally what you try to do is to solve a dispute in a way that in the end you end up with an enforceable award. So, as I said, when we look at party autonomy, um, it is also one of the major principles which comes or plays a role in helping me to structure the moot or to structure the case in a way that it's mootable. So you will find sometimes, as I said, odd agreements, and here comes an odd agreement from a party from the party, from practice. You have here an arbitration clause which was made it to the Indian Supreme Court where they first referred everything to arbitration under the rules of the Indian Council of Arbitration in accordance with the rules of the arbitration of the Indian Council of Arbitration. And then they come up with a second instance. If either party is in disagreement with the arbitration result in India, either party will have the right to appeal to a second arbitration in London in accordance with the rules of conciliation arbitration of the ICC. Something which is clearly possible under the rules of party autonomy, which you will not find frequently in practice, but where the parties have really looked into the specific of the case, came to the conclusion in the majority of cases, for us, we are happy with an arbitration in India because it will involve smaller, dis small amounts in dispute, and it doesn't make sense to bring the case to more expensive arbitration in Europe. But in, for certain disputes, we want to have the right to go to Europe with the second instance if we are unhappy with the arbitration at the first instance. And a second clause, which again comes from practice, it involves, you will find that, or that comes from a contract for the construction of several uh, hospitals in Germany. And the overall value of the contract was close to 2 billion. And they came up here with a five member contract advisory board. It was clear from the subsequent provision, which are not uh, reported here, that this was meant to be an arbitral tribunal. So not a three-member tribunal, but a five-member tribunal. And each party was entitled to appoint two members, but the two members had to be the CEO or the project director. And it all went up to the German Supreme Court. They went through an arbitration, came up to the German Supreme Court, and in enforcement proceedings of the award, only to be told by the German Supreme Court later on, yes, party autonomy normally allows you to take a five-member tribunal. However, here you appoint your own CEO. The CEO is in principle equal to a party and you're violating the right that no one should be judged in its own course. So practice shows you that these basic principles are very important first for exercising party autonomy, but also limiting party autonomy. Let me come to the last principle, which does not follow so much from the uh, characteristics of arbitration, which is the principle of good faith, which naturally plays a major role in this moot court case. And the principle of good faith, if you look at it from the substantive side, you have a clear provision in the CSG, which says in interpreting the CSG, um, you need to promote the uniformity in its application and the observance of good faith in international trade. That was one of the most, mostly or the high, the con one of the most contentious provisions at the diplomatic conference leading up to the CSG. What role do we give to good faith? 
And here in principle, the role is just in interpreting the CSG, but when you look at the jurisprudence of the CSG, it has involved, evolved into a principle governing largely behavior of the parties and where you very often have substantive provisions or substantive obligations following from the principle of good faith. So it has now become a general principle of the CSG in the sense of Article 7.2. And again, when you look at the unit of principles, again, you have a basic principle of good faith and fair dealing, and then a principle which comes close to what is relevant in this case here, Article 1.8, inconsistent behavior is prohibited. And last but not least, you have a number of provisions, good faith provisions in the many national arbitration laws, sections 242 of the German Civil Code, which is a very short provision of three lines. But when you look at the literature, at the commentaries, you have commentaries of close to a thousand pages just on these three lines, what follows from that. And then you have in the common law world, you have the principle of estoppel, or you have from the Roman tradition, the principle of veneer contra factum proprium, they all have the same basis, however, differ in their specific requirements a little bit. So whenever you look at one of these decisions addressing, for example, the German civil code, you must still look at the specific, specific issues to see whether that case really is relevant for you. But here, we're not so much talking about good faith concerning substance, we're talking about good faith concerning the procedure. And unlike in substance, you don't have a general rule on good faith in the Ancestral model law in a, and also not in many other arbitration laws. You have very specific rules which have explicitly been mentioned in the request for arbitration already in the European Convention and in the Swiss private international law, which deal specifically with the situation we have at first sight in our case here that the government uh, relies on internal restriction or governmental entities, or here do we have a governmental entity, which is a question, relies on internal restrictions to avoid an arbitration agreement in which, into which they have entered. And again, that has a different closing in different national settings. Sometimes it's covered by the principle of estoppel, some call it veneer contra factum proprium, other one call it the principle of good faith. As I said, there are very few specific rules. Nevertheless, it's now accepted that also arbitration proceedings or related proceedings, procedural issues are governed by these type of principle. And when you look at the practice, the principle confer concerns question of jurisdiction. So you have cases where they say contradictory pleadings as to the existence of an arbitration clause are not possible. If you have invoked an arbitration agreement in state court proceedings brought against you, you cannot then turn around when the other party brings arbitration proceedings and contest the existence of an arbitration agreement. You have that very often in the discussion concerning non-signatories. If the non-signatories invoke a right under a contract, there is a presumption that they are not only bound by the substantive provision of the contract, but also by the arbitration agreement contained in the contract. And then you have the specific principle set up in our, in our case here, you cannot rely on internal restrictions you have imposed yourself as a government or government entity um, if you have entered into an arbitration agreement. However, again, there may be limits to the principle of good faith. So no one would doubt that if you know that a company is represented by someone who has no power of attorney, um, that this company, that you cannot rely on uh, a contract signed by that person from which you know that they don't have power of attorney. So maybe there's a limit here to this non-reliance on internal restriction. But in addition, you have principles, principles of good faith may also affect the procedure. So you may give additional right or you may give additional time to one of the parties if, for example, an expert becomes or falls sick shortly before a hearing, if crucial witnesses do not appear in the hearing. And last but not least, also at the 
post-award stage concerning recognition enforcement, you may have arguments based on good faith contradictory behavior. So if you have not, if you have participated in an arbitration procedure without challenging the jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal, you may not, if the award is against you, later on turn around in the enforcement proceedings and contest the validity of the arbitration agreement. That was just a tour de force through the various principles underlying arbitration, which may play a role in this case. Are they really playing a role? I cannot tell you, but I'm happy to answer any other questions you may have, which are not directly case related. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Kroll. Um, I believe there may be some questions from the audience um, and we will be very willing to invite anyone that has a question to perhaps raise your hand in Zoom and then I can unmute you and then um, we would welcome you to ask your question to Professor Kroll. seems to be Sheena from Stress, Strathmore University. Uh, yes, good evening. Um, thank you very much for the lecture, Professor Kroll. Uh, my question um, has to do with, um, let me see, uh, a phrasing issue. Is there a difference or is there any weight attached to uh, us referring to an arbitration agreement as an agreement or as an arbitration clause? So I think when we were going through the question with some of my team members, we, it seemed as if claimant was so insistent on referring to their agreement as an arbitration agreement, but respondents were more willing to call it an, just an arbitration clause. So I was wondering if there's any legal weight that is attached to referring to it as an agreement or as a clause. I, I, I wasn't even aware. <laughs> That there is a uh, that I use different words in the in the um, in the case. Yeah, very often the different words are indicators of different understandings and are really important for that. But normally, an arbitration agreement is for me the broader concept, and you have um, which covers arbitration agreements concluded after a dispute, but also arbitration clauses included into a contract. Um, so separate arbitration agreements, but also the arbitration agreements conclude, included into or arbitration clauses included into a contract where it's just the clause of the contract. So there is in this, this case, no relevance of that distinction, arbitration clause, arbitration agreement. Thank you for that question, uh, Sheena. Um, if there's anyone else with a question, please feel free to raise your hand and either unmute yourself or we'll help unmute you. No, just to see, my, it was so clear that no one has any questions left. Uh, uh, Probably it's more that I spoke a little bit over the head of a lot of people here. Yeah. Oh, there is a question yeah, from Edisa. Yes, hello. Thank you for the presentation. I have a question about state of arbitration proceedings. Now, um, coming from a basis of law in the UK, um, we know that parties can apply to court for stay of court proceedings unless, of course, um, the tribunal can't uh, can't perform such um, 
a request by the parties. In a case like ours, where we have um, a question of corruption, is would that also be a valid reason for um, requesting a stay of proceedings if it's a domestic criminal act? That is a question which you have to answer here, yeah, where I cannot really give you any answer here. Yeah. Um, when you look through the materials, yeah, you will find that th that question is often raised in these type of proceedings. And um, that is for you to argue in one way or another, yeah, um, whether, first of all, whether there's a competence to do so. Yeah, and second, if there's a competence, whether the tribunal should exercise that competence to stay the proceedings. And as I said, I was, there may be a number of principles, yeah, which are in favor or against staying the proceedings in, in that case here. Uh, I don't want to get more specific. Uh, I think uh, in, if they invite me again shortly before the action mood takes place, maybe I can give more answers to that one. Uh, but uh, at present, uh, I think there's too many teams still struggling with the issue. And looking at the questions I've received, yeah, um, there there seems to be an issue there. Yeah? Okay, that's perfectly all right. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I think I think you know if if you don't get a response, it's a very good question. I think that's the the general feedback on this one. Um, I believe that uh, Sanjana also had a question but had some difficulties unmuting. So let's see if we can we can get that working. Um, and if not, I'll I'll ask it on her behalf. She sent it in the chat. Um, Sanjana, are you able to unmute? I take that as a no. Um, so, yes, she just confirmed she's not. So I'll ask the question on her behalf. Um, how important is synergy between common and civil law for procedural aspects of the problem? It is... Um... There, let's put it differently. Uh, there are certain cases where it it's a major... where it makes a major difference, whether someone comes from the civil law jurisdiction or someone comes from the common law jurisdiction. Um, here, it may play a limit, it plays a much more limited role than in previous, in, or at least the way I anticipated that. Yeah, It plays a more limited role, but it plays, may play a role. Yeah? Um, I cannot, cannot exclude that uh, someone coming from a common law background, which I'm not familiar with, yeah, would approach a certain problem, let's take the problem of stay of arbitration proceedings differently uh, and consider that to be a, a peculiar common law approach uh, um, then i would consider then i would do that from my ex or and i would consider that from my experience coming primarily from a civil law jurisdiction but having some experience and exposure to common law systems in in europe um, primarily the uk um, but that is something where, which is again important when you look at the CSG, uh, the CSG tells you to take into account the, um, the international background of the provision. Yeah? So not looking at a particular, um, particular legal tradition. And when you look at the CSG, it's really a mixture of uh, common and civil law concepts. In my view, with a slight uh, over uh, slight greater weight of civil law concepts, because uh, the the fathers of the CSG go back to uh, yeah a primary German professor yeah um, Ernst Rabel, who has drafted the first draft of the Hague Convention, and from there a lot went into the CSG. But it's a blend, yeah, and um, it, it's always also for the arbitrators interesting to see someone coming from a common law tradition looking at other things than someone coming from a civil law tradition. And my experience is the most successful arguments are the ones where you really blend the two, two traditions. Thank you again. Um, I see um, Conradus also has a question. Um, I will... If you can unmute yourself, please feel free to ask them. Okay, thank you. 
Um, thank you for the wonderful presentation, but I also had one question in particular. If I may refer and quote that you, there's some part when you're actually explaining about the party's autonomy, you restated that you actually retracted that statement and said that the parties are not actually that free because in some part of the autonomy they can be limited. Now I was really, I was really curious to know at the part of judicial determination on what is the limit in exercising that autonomy when it happens that the decision maker is actually not, not partial. His the decision maker is actually not neutral. How far can they actually? exercise that autonomy to be able to remove or change the decision maker or the arbitrator. Yeah, very good point. Uh, and that was one of the reasons why I brought you that example from Germany, uh, where you had, as I said, a billion multi or several billion uh, valued contract where they agreed on a three member on a five member tribunal, yeah, because it was such an important project. And they wanted to have the expertise of both parties within the tribunal and then said, OK, we have a, the fifth person, the chairman is someone completely neutral. But the German Supreme Court said this is so against the concept that no one can be judged in its own course. And they agreed on the CEO and the CEO is always representing is equivalent largely to the company that the German Supreme Court, after they have gone through an arbitration with which both parties considered to be a proper arbitration, and there were just disputes concerning the right to be heard, whether it has been violated, the German Supreme Court came to the conclusion, no, that is not even an arbitration, because you basically said in the tribunal, we have the two parties sitting and the parties would be judged in their own course. You could have also argued, and that may be different in different jurisdictions, you could have argued, okay, then the two parties, the two party appointed arbitrators basically level themselves out and we have someone completely neutral, the chairman deciding the case largely by him or herself. Um, so that may be really a difference. The outcome may have been different in different jurisdictions, yeah, depending on how much weight you give to that. And in Germany, enormous weight is given to that. And we also used to have a provision in the old German arbitration law before it was replaced by the ancestral model law, which said, if there's an inequality, inequality of the parties in appointing the tribunal, then the arbitration clause is invalid. Not that you say, okay, then I can rebalance the tribunal by get court appointment, but Germany considered that to be so important that they said, if you agree on something which has an imbalance in the tribunal, we will consider the arbitration agreement to be invalid. So very good point. I currently do not see any more questions. So if there's anyone else that has a, a last minute question, I think this is the time to, uh, to, to raise the hand in Zoom. And if not, which, I, which, I, which seems to be the case, um, then I think we, we all thank Professor Kroll for his time this evening and for his, his, his excellent lecture, which I'm sure will be very helpful to all teams in the next few months in the Vismut. Um, and we all look forward to meet in Vienna, obviously. Um, so let's look forward to that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Kroll. Thank and you maybe for you would attention. like to say. And all the best, all the best to you for the next months. There may be times when you regret of having participated yeah but in the end it will be really rewarding and i hope you make it to vienna and uh yeah i look forward to seeing as many as possible from you in vienna and take it as an educational exercise it's probably more than you will ever get at the university all the best thank you